Muy buenas noches, amados hermanos y amigos. Good evening, beloved brethren and friends present here in San Lucas, Guatemala. It is a great privilege to be with you on this occasion to share some moments of fellowship around the Word of God and His program pertaining to this end time. For this reason, I want to read in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, starting from verse 7 and on, where it says, And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass, when Moses went out into the tabernacle, that all the people rose up, and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped, every man and his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy in whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. May God bless our souls with his word and allow us to understand it. Our subject for this occasion is my presence shall go with thee. You may be seated if you're so kind. The Hebrew people according to the flesh are Abraham's seed. And the Hebrew people represent 
they are a type and figure of the temple which is in heaven. They are also a type and figure of all mankind and they are a type and figure of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are a type and figure of every human being as an individual. In the Hebrew people, notice, God has reflected the temple which is in heaven. He has reflected all mankind. And He has reflected the church of Jesus Christ. And He has reflected each person as an individual. Everything that we can see has happened to the Hebrew people throughout their history, we find was also reflected in Jacob. Everything the Hebrew people would go through was reflected in Jacob. It had also been reflected in Abraham. Now notice how Let's see in Genesis how God accompanied Abraham and how he accompanied Isaac and also how he accompanied Jacob. In Genesis, we find something very important regarding the Hebrew people. Notice in Genesis 48, verse 15, when Jacob is blessing his grandchildren, Joseph's sons, it says, starting from verse 13 and on, it says, in Genesis chapter 48, and Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, towards Israel's left hand, Jacob's left hand, meaning Israel's, and Manasseh in his left hand, meaning Joseph's left hand, towards Israel's right hand. Because Joseph was facing his father Jacob. And he had his two sons. Joseph had his younger son, Ephraim, at his right hand. And he had Manasseh at his left hand. So that when he went before his father and put them before his father, well, Joseph would be facing Jacob or Israel and Manasseh, who was at Joseph's left hand, would then be facing Jacob's right hand. And Ephraim, who was at Joseph's right hand, would be at Jacob's left hand. That is, because Jacob and Joseph were facing each other face to face. And Israel, or Jacob, stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head. In other words, he put his hand like this. He crossed it and laid it on Ephraim. And now notice how Ephraim was at Joseph's right hand, and now he ends up at Jacob's right hand, when Jacob stretches out his right hand over Ephraim. From Joseph's right hand to Jacob's right hand. And the great blessing was spoken over Ephraim. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joseph. 
Notice he lays his hands on Joseph's sons to bless Joseph. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. Now notice. God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk. They walked before the presence of God. The presence of God was with them, always accompanying them. And now, the presence of God was also accompanying Jacob. And, therefore, what would happen with the Hebrew people was already reflected in Abraham and Isaac and in Jacob. The presence of God was with them. Therefore, it would be with the Hebrew people. And now notice how the Hebrew people, the earthly Israel, and also the heavenly Israel were in Abraham. And if the presence of God was accompanying Abraham, the father of faith and Isaac and Jacob, then it would also accompany the earthly Israel, Abraham's earthly seed. And it would also accompany Abraham's heavenly seed, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, the blessing that Jacob bestows upon his grandchildren, and by blessing his grandchildren, he is blessing Joseph. And he says, He says, The angel which redeemed me, notice, he says, The God which fed me all my life long unto this day, because he fed him, he took care of him, and he accompanied him all the days of his life because the presence of God was with Jacob. The angel would redeem me from all evil. Notice, he redeemed him from all evil that came against Jacob. Bless the lads. And let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased them, and he held up his father's hand, meaning he grabbed it to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. A people. Manasseh would become what? A people. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And when he says a multitude of nations, that shows us that from Ephraim, not only will there come a seed for the Hebrew people, but also for a multitude of nations. In other words, out of all, the sons of Jacob, out of all the sons of Jacob, the blessing that God had spoken to Abraham in Genesis chapter, let's see, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and on says, 
Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And now... Let's turn to another scripture in chapter 13, verse 14 and on of Genesis, it says, And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Then, let's turn to chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse... 15, chapter 15, verse 1 and on says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And there, God continues to show him everything God would give him. And God made a covenant with Abraham that day that he would give him that land. And now, he also told him that his seed would serve in a land that is not theirs, meaning in Egypt, but he didn't tell him it was Egypt. Isaac had not even been born yet. Not even Ishmael had been born yet, let alone Isaac. And God is already speaking to him about his seed and about the stages that his seed would go through. But then afterwards, God would deliver them from that bondage and he would take them to that promised land and he would give them a great blessing there. But now, let's see. Abraham already, in Genesis chapter 17, when he was already, he was already how old? He was 99 years old, and the son had not been born yet. Chapter 17 of Genesis says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between thee, me and thee. 
and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. There we have the promise that God will make nations of Abraham. But notice, anyone may say, Abraham has to go and start having many children and many nations. But notice, what Abraham needed to have was a son, the promised son through whom the fulfillment of that promise would come. Although Abraham would also have other sons through whom nations would also come. Now it says, And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And now, notice how here we have the promise that Abraham will be the father of many people of many nations. He will make nations out of him, out of Abraham. And now, let's see where it tells us here. In chapter 17 also, verse 15 and on, it says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. In other words, through that son who would be born, Abraham would be a father of nations and Sarah would be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with the seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Now God is telling him that by the next year, the sun would already be on earth. That is why, notice, Abraham was already, before God tells him this year, it says Abraham was 99 years old. And now it says, unto him that is 100 years old. Let's see. It says, Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? See, because he was 99 years old, and he's already seeing that at a hundred years old, he was going to receive a son through Sarah's wife. Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And when he was a hundred years old, the promised son came, 
and Sarah was 90 years old. Now, how many women would like to be 90 years old and be able to bear children? Well, Sarah was 90 years old, but he was already rejuvenated. And now, notice, after that, Sarah lived a number of more years, and then she had to depart. And Abraham lived 175 years. In other words, he lived 75 years in addition to the 100 years he already lived. Notice, Sarah lived 127 years. Genesis chapter 23 says, And Sarah was 127 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Every woman would like to live at least 127 years, but with Sarah's health. And now, when Sarah was 100 years old, how old was her son? 10 years old. A woman who was 100 years old had a 10-year-old son, but her youth was renewed. So there wasn't much of a noticeable difference in terms of being an older woman with a 10-year-old son. And now, Abraham noticed, Abraham lived after Sarah died. Well, he had another companion, another wife, and he had six more children. But at 175 years old, he departed. Genesis chapter 25, verse 7 says, and these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived in 103 score and 15 years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people. He went to paradise. Now notice, God accompanied Abraham all the days of his life. And... Under the covenant that God established with Abraham, God always accompanied Abraham, and God told him, Whoever blesses you will be blessed, whoever curses you will be cursed. And that blessing also went on to Isaac and then to Jacob. That is why that blessing then went to the Hebrew people, the earthly Israel. And then that blessing has gone to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavenly Israel. Therefore, the Hebrew people and the church of Jesus Christ have that blessing from God. Whoever blesses them will be blessed, and whoever curses them will be cursed. In St. Matthew 25, there we find that this is a reality. And that is why in this same chapter 25, verse 31 and on, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto him on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and he came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when shall we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least, 
of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. See, these people who have helped the members of the church of Jesus Christ have their reward. Because whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, meaning to one of the members of the church of Jesus Christ, to one of the brethren of Jesus Christ, because he's our elder brother, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. He says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, and also in the Psalms, so these younger brothers, these younger brethren of Jesus Christ are the members of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the people who have done favors for the church of Jesus Christ, the members of the church of Jesus Christ, will marvel because they do not know there is a blessing from God, that blessing since that blessing was spoken to Abraham. Although that blessing has also existed before in the prophets before Abraham, but now that blessing is more pronounced in Abraham. It says, whoever blesses you will be blessed. Now, a person who helps or does a favor for God's elect is bringing a blessing to an elect. And that is why when an elect has needed something and he has cried out to God and God has sent someone, he has touched someone and the person comes and helps that elect of God and his need is met, the elect says, God sent me this blessing through so and so. And now, since that person has brought a blessing for an elect or for the mystical body of Christ as a group, he is blessing an elect or he is blessing the church of Jesus Christ as a group. Therefore, that person will also receive his blessing. And also, when they speak well of the elect, they are blessing God's elect. And when they ask God to bless them, they are asking for a blessing for the elect. Therefore, they will also receive a blessing. But whoever rises up against God's elect, against the church of Jesus Christ, as a group or against an elect, as an individual, and starts to speak ill of him or attack him in certain ways, or physically too, that person is looking for trouble before God because God is with his church and with each son and daughter of God as an individual. Therefore, that person is rising up against God himself. That is why God's children must always be careful because with one action against the child of God, the person who does it is hindered. And with one action in favor of God's children or child of God, the person or people are benefited. And that is why God's elect must stay on the right path and not look for or create problems, but instead be a blessing wherever they go so that other people can receive blessings as well. We want everyone to be blessed by God. And with the presence of the members of the mystical body of Christ on this earth, God's blessing is there because the presence of God is in His church, the heavenly Israel, just like it was with the Hebrew people through the wilderness when Moses was leading them to the promised land and when 
Then, when they went into the promised land with Joshua, the presence of God was also among the Hebrew people. And now, we find that throughout time, the Hebrew people have had problems. But God has been watching over the Hebrew people because God loves the Hebrew people. And the Hebrew people are Abraham's earthly seed according to the flesh. Now, the presence of God was there in the days of Moses. God spoke with Moses face to face. And when Moses would enter the temple, notice what would happen there in the temple. For God told the prophet Moses in chapter 25, verse... Let's read from verse 21 and on so that... You can read the rest later on. Verses 21 to 22 of Exodus, chapter 25 says, And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now notice, in the temple, God was present there, in the Holy of Holies, above the mercy seat. And Moses would enter the temple. He would go into the Holy of Holies. And from there, God would speak to Moses all the things that Moses had to speak to the people. Now notice, how was the presence of God among the Hebrew people? And where was it? In the temple, in the Holy of Holies, of the temple that Moses had built. And now... The Ark of the Covenant went among the Hebrew people, and God's presence was there among the Hebrew people, and that presence of God covered all the Hebrew people, and God's blessing covered the Hebrew people. And notice how Jordan opened up before the presence of God. And likewise, you can see that God's presence was among the Hebrew people. And we can see that it was in the Holy of Holies of the temple Moses built or the tabernacle Moses built. Then, when they went into the promised territory, God's presence was there and it was above the mercy seat. But from there, it covered the whole territory of Israel. And then, when Solomon built the temple, we find that he dedicated it to God, and God's presence entered the temple. It was manifested in the temple, and it was there in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, above the Ark of the Covenant, above the Mercy Seat. The Ark of the Covenant was put in the Holy of Holies, and God's presence was there. Now, notice how the Hebrew people have had that great blessing from God. Everything that would happen to the Hebrew people was already reflected in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now we can see the reason why Jacob's life was difficult. Notice, all of that was reflecting the lives of the Hebrew people, of the seed of Jacob, which is the same seed of Isaac and the same seed of Abraham. Abraham's seed came through that line. Now, I told you, Israel represents the temple which is in heaven. It also represents the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it also represents the temple or tabernacle.
because the Hebrew people are represented in that temple or tabernacle that Moses built and the one that Solomon built. Now, Israel represents all mankind too. Because the temple Moses built and the temple Solomon built represent all mankind, including the Hebrew people. And now, let's see how with mankind represented in the Hebrew people, we have the outer court which covers all the Gentiles. We have the holy place which pertains to the territory of Israel and we have the Holy of Holies which is Jerusalem. See how the Hebrew people represent all mankind? And now... Let's see. Let's say that again. There is something here. Uh, we have to correct something here. Let's see. The Hebrew people as a nation represent all mankind. The outer court, the territory of Israel, represents mankind. The territory of Israel represents mankind, which is divided into three parts. The Gentiles and that is Israel the outer court, in other words, the territory of Israel, then Jerusalem, the holy place, and then the temple, the holy of holies. And in the divine program, there we have the three parts of the temple, the holy of holies, in the territory of Israel, that is the temple, the holy place, that is Jerusalem, and the outer court, that is the territory of Israel, meaning all the other places besides the temple and Jerusalem. And now, let's look at mankind as a temple from Adam to Jesus. We have the outer court from Jesus to the angel of Jesus. We have the holy place. And from the angel of Jesus and on, we have the Holy of Holies. And in the Church of Jesus Christ, which is the spiritual temple of Christ, notice the outer court is from Adam to Jesus. And the holy place is from Jesus to the angel of Jesus. And from the angel of Jesus and on, it's the Holy of Holies. And now, for anyone who doesn't belong to the Holy of Holies, well, then, there's a holy place. And for anyone who doesn't belong to the holy place, well, then there's the outer court, where many people at the end time will have a place if they don't have a place in the holy place as part of the ages of the gentle church and the time of the apostles back then, which pertains to the dispensation of grace, then they will have a place in the outer court. 
because notice what it says here in the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 and on it says after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb cloth with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. He will spread His tabernacle and dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. These people are the ones who are appointed as the foolish or sleeping virgins who did not take oil in their lamps, and that is why they could not be changed. And therefore, they could not go to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. Notice the foolish virgins. When the announcement of the coming of the bridegroom came, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. They all woke up, but some had oil, and others did not have oil. And the ones that had oil were the ones who had the Holy Spirit. They had believed in Christ as their Savior, they had washed away their sins in the blood of Christ, and they had received the Spirit of Christ, which is the oil that the wise virgins had in their lamps, in other words, in their person, on their body, in their being. And now, the time comes for the coming of the Son of Man, and the foolish ones went to buy oil to search for the Holy Spirit. But the wise ones had it. And the bridegroom came. And who went in with him? St. Matthew 25, verse 10 to 13 says, and while they, the foolish, went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The Son of Man coming with his angels, notice, is the bridegroom. 
And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. With the coming of the Son of Man, and with the virgins who had oil in their lamps, the wise virgins going with him to the marriage, the door is shut, and at a certain point, the dispensation of grace is shut to the extent that when the other virgins return, the door is already shut. That is why they will have to go through the great tribulation. That is why it says, it says, but he answered and said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. There we can see that those foolish virgins are put in the great tribulation because they cannot be changed. They cannot go to the marriage supper of the Lamb because they didn't go into the marriage of the Lamb. The ones in the marriage are the ones who later go to the supper, which is the reception, the wedding feast. In other words, the reception feast. And that feast will be in heaven, in the house of our Heavenly Father, where we will go cloth with the new body the changed, glorified, and eternal body that He will give us. In Revelation chapter 15, verse 1 and on, Revelation 15, verse 1 and on, it says, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and that that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. They acknowledge him as King of saints, even though when they try to come into the marriage, it's already too late. But notice, they are put in this place, it says. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. In the temple Solomon built, and the temple Moses built, where was the brazen sea? It was in the outer court, and the foolish virgins are put there. They are put in the outer court. In other words, they find a place in the house of God, but not in the holy place, nor in the holy of holies, but rather in the outer court of the house of God, where God spreads for this tabernacle and makes a place for that group that will go through the Great Tribulation, but it will give their lives for Christ. Even though they couldn't be changed and go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, they will stay here on earth going through the Great Tribulation. They will be persecuted. The beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, along with those nations and kings that will give them their power and their strength and the armies of those nations, will persecute the foolish virgins and also persecute the Hebrew people. And they will be martyrs during the Great Tribulation. Both the foolish or sleeping virgins 
as well as the 144,000 Hebrews. But the 144,000 Hebrews will rise at the end of the Great Tribulation to live in the Millennial Kingdom and to serve Christ and His Church during that time. They are the eunuchs of the temple. They will serve the king and the queen during the millennial kingdom. Those are the ones who are called and gathered at this end time by the angel who comes with the seal of the living God. In other words, he comes with the Holy Spirit at the last day because the seal of the living God is the Holy Spirit. It's through that manifestation of the Holy Spirit through His angel messenger that God's presence will return to the Hebrew people. That is why in Ezekiel chapter 37, the Hebrew people represented in that valley full of dry bones will be restored because those dry bones are raised and that army, that nation is formed again and then the last thing they need is to have a spirit because the body without the spirit is dead. And God tells the prophet Ezekiel to call the spirit of God. And now notice how he has to call it. God said, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. In other words, if the body does not have the spirit, it is dead. Life is given by the spirit. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. And now notice how the prophet had to prophesy. In chapter 37, verse 3 and on, when he is shown this valley of bones, then God tells him, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold a shaken, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, at the end time, what the Hebrew people will need is the Spirit of God returning to the Hebrew people. Because the Spirit of God, from time to time, that the gospel went to the Gentiles, the Spirit of God has been in the Gentiles. The presence of God has been among the Gentiles with the heavenly Israel, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the presence of God has been in and with 
the church of the Lord Jesus Christ from age to age. And it has been leading his church from stage to stage, leading her to the promised land of the new body and to the promised land of the glorious millennial kingdom, where we will be reigning with Christ as kings and priests. And now, we have seen that just as the presence of God was with the Hebrew people in that journey from Egypt to the Promised Land, now, the presence of God, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant, which is Jesus Christ, has been in the heavenly Israel, in his church, from stage to stage, leading his church to the promised land of the new body, that is, the glorified and eternal body, and to the promised land of the glorious millennial kingdom. This is what he has been carrying out from age to age, manifesting his presence from age to age. The angel of the covenant, which is the angel of the Lord, has been manifested from age to age in the messenger of each age among his church. That is where the presence of God, the presence of the Lord has been among the heavenly Israel. And at this end time, we come into the age of the cornerstone with the presence of God, the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord Jesus Christ among his church and Holy Spirit in the age of the cornerstone because the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ himself in Holy Spirit. And now, notice, where is the presence of the angel of the Lord, of Jesus Christ at the last day, in his church, so that she may be there face to face before the angel of the Lord receiving his voice, his word, and thus receiving all the knowledge of all these things which must happen at this end time. And during the millennial kingdom, well, we will be with him here on earth, all of us in eternal bodies, reigning with Christ and seeing him face to face too. Now, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, verse 12, it says, For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. This is for the age of the cornerstone where the angel of the covenant, whom we have seen manifested in his angel messengers through the history of the church of Jesus Christ, now we will see him in the age of the cornerstone manifested in his angel messenger speaking to us all these things which must shortly come to pass at this end time. We will be seeing him face to face in his manifestation in human flesh, because no man has seen God at any time. But the people who have testified in the Bible that they have seen God face to face, they have seen him manifested in his theophanic body of the sixth dimension. And then, when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among human beings, in the veil of flesh, called Jesus, those who lived in those days saw God face to face in his manifestation in human flesh. And at the last day, all the elect who will be living at the end time and will receive the voice of Christ, the message of Jesus Christ, 
the word of Christ for this end time through the manifestation of Christ, the angel of the covenant, the Holy Spirit, through his angel messenger, they will be seeing Jesus Christ face to face manifested in human flesh in his angel messenger. In other words, what they will be seeing is the veil of flesh where Christ will be manifested. But that veil of flesh, that angel of Jesus Christ, is not the Lord Jesus Christ. He's only the instrument of Christ for that manifestation of Jesus Christ of the last day where we will be seeing the manifestation of Christ, the angel of the covenant, face to face at this end time in the Holy of Holies of the spiritual temple of Christ, which is the age of the cornerstone, which is fulfilled among his church in Latin America and the Caribbean. And that manifestation of Christ among his church at the last day through his angel messenger is the manifestation of the Son of Man with his angels, manifesting the ministries of Moses for the second time, Elijah for the fifth time, and Jesus for the second time. Just like in the Holy of Holies, up on the mercy seat, there were two cherubims of gold, which in the church of Jesus Christ represent the ministries of Moses and Elijah. And in the temple which is in heaven, they represent the ministries of Gabriel and Michael, the archangels who are in heaven, in the temple of God. And now, in the church of Jesus Christ, God's elect would be seeing God's manifestation of the last day face to face through the angel of Jesus Christ sent to testify all these things which must shortly come to pass at this end time. And that is where we will be seeing the presence of the angel of the Lord, of the angel of the covenant, of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit among his church, because the presence of Christ has been among his church from age to age. He has never left his church. He has remained among his church. And when an age has ended, he has opened up a new age by sending a new messenger. And with him leading his church to the promised land of the new body and the promised land of the millennial kingdom, he will take us to the promised land of the new body, just as he has placed us in the promised land of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the promised land of the second exodus, just as the promised land of the first exodus was the land of Israel, and the promised land of the third exodus is the new body, he will give us and the glorious millennial kingdom. The promised land as a body, as a land, as a body, is the new body he will give us, a glorified body. And the new land, the new kingdom, is the glorious millennial kingdom. Now we have seen how God's presence must be among his people to reach the promised land. Moses said, if you don't go with me, don't take us out of this place. And now, notice how the Hebrew people were journeying from place to place. And now notice how the heavenly Israel has been journeying from age to age, and the church of Jesus Christ has been journeying from place to place. 
The first age was fulfilled in Asia Minor. We have one place there. And then, in the journey of the Church of Jesus Christ, we go to the second age, and it was fulfilled in France. Just as the Hebrew people were taken from place to place, from territory to territory, and the presence of God was with and among Israel and with the prophet Moses. And now we have seen how God has been moving his church from stage to stage and from age to age and from territory to territory and how he has been manifesting through his messengers accompanying his church from age to age and leading his church from age to age through the different territories where each stage of the church of Jesus Christ would be fulfilled. And now notice, he accompanied his church in the age it was fulfilled in Asia Minor. He accompanied her in the age it was fulfilled in France. He accompanied her in the age that was fulfilled in Hungary. He accompanied her in the age that was fulfilled in Scotland and Ireland. He accompanied her in the age that was fulfilled in Germany. He accompanied her in the age that was fulfilled in England. He accompanied her in the age that was fulfilled in North America. And now he is accompanying his church in the age that's being fulfilled in Latin America and the Caribbean. The age of the cornerstone, the most important age of the spiritual temple of Christ, because it's the age that pertains to the Holy of Holies. And now, everything that was represented in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, notice how it was fulfilled in the Hebrew people and how it was also fulfilled in the heavenly Israel, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have reached the most glorious time where we can see the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the angel of the covenant among his church and the age of the cornerstone in the Latin American and Caribbean territory. And face to face, we can see his presence manifested among his church through his angel messenger sent to testify all these things in the churches. Now, his angel is not the Lord Jesus Christ. He is only the prophet messenger of the age of the cornerstone and of the dispensation of the kingdom. That is why he comes with the message of the gospel of the kingdom, testifying all these things which must shortly come to pass at this end time. The presence of God of Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, is in his church and with his church at this last day and with his angel messenger of the last day and he will take us to the promised land of the eternal body and to the promised land of the glorious millennial kingdom we will be changed when the dead in Christ rise and then all together we will go to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven in the house of our Heavenly Father to enjoy those three and a half years of a heavenly feast where He will give out the rewards to each one of his children of the heavenly Israel. And there he will give us the position that we will then occupy in his kingdom. Remember graduations? Some graduate in a university that is celebrating a graduation, some graduate as lawyers, others graduate as doctors, others graduate as one thing or another, but each one of them graduate at university. And those graduations for doctors uh, I don't know if they take place the same day or another day, 
Hay colegios there are colleges where they la, may have everyone's graduation at the same time or they may separate it the graduation of the doctors one day the graduation of the lawyers another day the graduation of the engineers another day but remember during a certain time it's graduation time and that is where they obtain their title because they have passed all the studies that were required to obtain their position that they would carry out as professionals on earth. And now, in our position as kings, we have a graduation that will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is where we will have that great graduation in which God will be responsible for rewarding every man according to his work. According to how he has worked on the kingdom of God, both spiritually and physically. According to how he has worked spiritually and physically in the kingdom of God of God. Now we have seen how Christ has been leading his people, his church, from age to age, and we have seen God's presence among the heavenly Israel. And now, when Israel went into the promised land, notice, they went in because God went in and God led them to the promised land. We have seen in the temple of Moses and the temple Solomon built that the Holy of Holies is the most important part of that temple. And currently, the Church of Jesus Christ is in the Holy of Holies because the Church is the spiritual temple of Jesus Christ. And now, the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies of the temple once a year, which represented the entrance of Christ into the Holy of Holies of the Heavenly Temple, in which He has been since He ascended to heaven. He has been making intercession there with His precious blood. He has been there making intercession as High Priest, but in Holy Spirit, He has been manifested in His Church from age to age, and He is the High Priest. Therefore, we have had, just as the High Priest ministered in the outer court and ministered in the Holy Place, and then also ministered in the Holy of Holies, Christ, Melchizedek, the High Priest of the Temple, which is in Heaven, has ministered in the outer court in the holy place and in the holy of holies from Genesis until he entered heaven. And now, in his church, which is also a temple, Jesus Christ has been ministering as high priest. He has ministered in the outer court from Adam to Jesus. He has ministered in the holy place from the day of Pentecost until this end time. And he would minister in the Holy of Holies, which is the most important part, where he ministers among his church, and that is for this end time, in the age of the cornerstone. And the work that he does here in the age of the cornerstone is the work 
that will lead us to the transformation of our bodies and the resurrection of the dead in Christ. And even while Christ is still high priest in heaven, here in the age of the cornerstone, he reflects everything he is doing in heaven in the Holy of Holies of the temple of God. And the high priest included in his garments, one of the things included in his garments was a mitre or a golden plate in his forehead worn on the turban or that headpiece or was it called a mitre, Miguel? The mitre is a turban and the diadem is the golden plate that is worn in front which is tied with special strings and he would go into the temple and do you know what was written there? Holiness to the Lord. The name of God was written there. Y-H-W. Now notice how the eternal name of God was written in the forehead of the high priest who entered into the Holy of Holies, who ministered in the outer court, the holy place, and the Holy of Holies too. Notice how God wrote his name upon a man in such a simple way because Christ, notice, at the last day would write his name upon the overcomer. And now, when we hear about the name being written, we turn to Revelation chapter 22, verse 4, and it says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. See where that name is written? In the forehead. Also in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And now, even though the name of God has been in his church the whole time because the angel of the covenant has been there who is the one that has the eternal name of God, the angel of the Lord. Now, it's in the age of the head, which is the age of the mind. There, in the forehead, is where the eternal name of God, which is the new name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, is placed, is written with the angel of the covenant, the Holy of Holies. Well, the name was there. Wherever the angel of the covenant is, that is where the name is. But now, by it being written on a golden plate, and put on the forehead of Aaron, the high priest, and then Aaron's successors. Now that shows us that at the last day, Christ will come to his church and be in his church, and he, the high priest, has been ministering from age to age in his different stages, and now he presents himself before the Holy of Holies, and Jesus Christ, the high priest, will be there with that eternal name, the eternal name of God, and new name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his manifestation, that name will be written. The new name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and eternal name of God. And that is for the stage of the Holy of Holies, where the eternal name of God and new name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed and will be seen by those who will be there. We have seen that it was on the high priest, on the forehead of the high priest, and we also find that it was in the Holy of Holies, above the mercy seat, because the angel of the covenant was there. Now we can see the invisible part, the angel of the covenant who was there, and we can see the visible part, the high priest with the name written on his forehead. And now Christ says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God and my new name. There we can see that promise to be fulfilled at the last day in the work of Christ ministering as high priest in the Holy of Holies. We have seen the presence of God among Israel accompanying the prophet sent by God, Moses, a type and figure of the manifestation of the presence of Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, in the heavenly Israel, accompanying the messenger that he would have in each age and manifesting himself through the messenger of each age. And then, at the last day, the presence of Christ in Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the angel of the covenant of the angel of the Lord in the age of the cornerstone, accompanying the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect of the age of the cornerstone in the Latin American and Caribbean territory. And if someone has gone to another nation, the blessing of God's presence pertaining to this end time will reach him all the way over there. And we will all reach the promised land of the new body and also the promised land of the glorious millennial kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. We will continue tomorrow under the subject the veil that Christ has removed for us. There we will also see that whole part about the seed of Ephraim, who is the one that has a promise of the blessing to become a multitude of nations, a promise that is fulfilled through Christ in the work that he has been doing and that he continues to do at this end time with and among Gentile nations. May the blessings of Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, who is among us at this end time, be upon all of you and also upon me. And soon, may we all be changed and taken to the house of our Heavenly Father to the marriage supper of the Lamb, in the eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I will leave Reverend Miguel Bermudez Marin here with us again to continue and conclude our participation tonight by thanking our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Let's see if Miguel is getting here.
What time is it, Miguel? It's barely eight. With all that we've heard, it's not even 10 o'clock in the evening. It's 8 in the evening and we have finished very early. This is the time we start in some places. In Mexico, right? And in Chile, sometimes we start at 8 or 8.30 more or less. And here, we are finishing early. That is our desire in our journey in which we are passing through this earth, but we are on our way to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, to the house of our Heavenly Father. And to get there, we need to be like Christ our Savior. We need to have the eternal and glorified body just like the body of Jesus Christ. That is why our desire is to be like Christ in order to reach the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, to reach heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem, and thus enjoy that great feast, Jerusalem. There is an earthly Jerusalem, and there is a heavenly Jerusalem. I will follow Jesus Christ, and we will go with him to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I will follow Jesus Christ because his presence is with us at this end time among his people. Let's talk about Christ to everyone and let's make known what he has promised us and that he is preparing us to take us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's always be talking in our journey through this earth. Let's always be talking about Christ and about his presence among his church at this end time, as it has been in past times, and making known the great blessing that he is giving us at this end time, so that soon we may go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. May God continue to bless you all. May God keep you. And I leave Reverend Miguel Bermudez Marin with us again to continue and conclude our participation on this occasion. Tomorrow we will have the subject, the veil that Christ has removed. The veil that Christ has removed for us. Pray a lot so that tomorrow God gives us everything He wants us to hear and so that He opens our understanding and we may see face to face. Remember, that is behind the veil that we see face to face. Therefore, we must get to the other side of the veil. The veil must be removed so that we can see face to face. So let us leave Miguel here now. Otherwise, we will have tomorrow's subject, but it's best to leave that alone for tomorrow. May God bless you and everyone continue having an evening filled with the blessings of Jesus Christ, our Savior. God bless you.